Hi, welcome back to Hope 2020. We're really glad that you're with us. Right now we have the, in, the famous Russell Hansen, who's a well-known bioscientist and uh, biohacker. So I'd like to pass it over to Russell and he's going to bring you his uh, presentation straight away. Thank you. All right, Russell, you're on. All right, thanks JP for the introduction and uh, welcome to everybody on the stream. My name is Russell Hansen. I'm here in the beautiful World Trade Center in New York City, um, not in the Hotel Pennsylvania, though we've always had some good times down there. So um, my talk is about brain hacking and uh, neuroscience and artificial intelligence, and let's get going. So uh, just a little bit of background about me, um, in case you don't know me already. Uh, the presenter said I'm infamous. I'm not sure that's true. Um, I'm not sure I'm famous either. So um, back in the day, Vice wrote about me saying, this guy wants to help you download your brain. I do. I'd love to help you download your brain. Um, I've been talking about it for a long time on Vice and the 21st Chaos Communication Congress in Berlin and uh, lots of other places. Um, pretty nice hacker conference in Istanbul called Locard, and um, I worked as a professor at Mount Sinai for a while in the genetics and genomic sciences department, where I worked on brain imaging and um, applications of artificial intelligence to brain imaging. Um, in the, uh, the live version of this talk, I uh, I apologize for uh, not being able to bring in some really fancy brain imaging machines, but um, here we can uh, view you know, a typical MRI or CT or uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation machine. You can also look at you know, mice being hooked up to uh, <clears throat> different types of optogenetic um, interfaces, so you know, then you can uh, inject mouse brains with reagents that cause the, the mouse brain to react um, to light and also to allow you to, to image the, the mouse's brain uh, using a, an implant in the mouse's brain. And here the mouse is in a virtual environment, so you can't have the, the mouse um, working in a... Uh, a regular kind of maze environment. You have to put them on this plain little ball. Um, but this is a real experiment. This is done. So, you know, uh, I believe that neuroscience and artificial intelligence are, are really picking up and they have been uh, for many years now, frankly. So uh, one can use synthetic data from trained neural networks. You can use highly parallelized multimodal imaging, uh, traditional radiology, including MRIs and CTs and PET scanners. Um, that's a positron emission tomography, not animal type of PET scanners. Uh, in addition, there's traditional medical imaging, so histology and pathology, um, and the precision medicine scheme of getting the right met drugs to the right person at the right time can be hugely augmented by using artificial intelligence. So instead of a doctor looking at a patient and having to biopsy their brain, you know, a MRI machine with a trained neural network can simply scan that person's brain and determine pretty rapidly what's going wrong with them um, just by using huge amounts of trained or labeled neural network data. Uh, sometimes people like this uh, illustration of uh, you know, the similarities and differences between um, neural networks and artificial neural networks and real neural networks. So there's, let's see if I can get this. The, um, the soundtrack wasn't that interesting anyway. So here what you see is a, uh, a perceptron type neural network uh, using the MNIST uh, handwriting database with uh, 2,000 hidden neurons and it looks like 1.1 million synapses. So this is a rather old-fashioned type of neural network. And uh, as this video progresses, you'll see it move through several different types of neural networks, um, from perceptrons to multi-layer perceptrons. 
and so forth, and finally ending up on a spiking neural network. So humans and mice and rats and chimpanzees and all, all, all organic organisms use some type of spiking neural network, frankly. Let's fast forward a little bit. So this last one is a spiking neural network. And in the spiking neural network, you can see how things, you know, the structure of the network is really random. And it, it's still able to perform this uh, handwriting recognition task. But you can see how these, you know, it, this is not, this is how a, a biological brain is organized, you know, much like your brain or a mouse brain. Very different from the, the multi-layer perceptron, but it still accomplishes the same thing. So sometimes we joke in the lab that you know a scientist uses um, his or her brain to train a neural network to analyze brains, which are themselves neural networks. So you know you have a scientist, and you have a, a multi-layer hidden, you know, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer, and you use that to uh, analyze normal brains and Alzheimer's brains. So you know there, there's no limit really to how many types of brains can be used to uh, analyze other brains. And we, we do this in the lab um, on things like uh, Alzheimer's data. So this is uh, neuropathology data. These are little neurons. And it, when they're brown, it means they're dying or close to dying. Uh, it's a, they're infected with a disease called tau pathology. And the, uh, the microtubule associated protein tau uh, grows excessively when, when organisms are hit uh, in the head, boxers, football players, and so on. And uh, you know what we did is we built a little neural network, and what it was able to do is to annotate. This is a real human brain, a, a very old person who has most likely pretty serious dementia, Alzheimer's. And um, you know we continue to do this to this day. Um, one of the ways you can do this is using a fully convolutional network to go from uh, patches to pixels. So an FCN or a fully convolutional neural network allows you to, to do pixel-wise um, annotation of uh, brains. And you know, again, this is just sort of the neural network architecture to do uh, these types of calculations. Um, Image to image translation is actually a, uh, a pretty cool area of artificial intelligence right now. So you can turn a, a horse into a zebra. Um, and it, it's just sort of a, a trick. Um, and, and what this means is that in a scientific or biological milieu, you can, um, you can transform one data set into another. So you could transform a, dementia data set into an Alzheimer's data set or a healthy brain into an unhealthy brain by using a, a consistent loss function. <clears throat> and you can do it in real time if your computers are fast enough. And you know it's a little bit choppy, maybe, but it's still pretty convincing. Sort of. It, it looks like a computer-generated zebra. Like the lighting isn't right, and you know, it's it's a research project. This isn't Hollywood. You know, many other different types of uh, neural networks can be used for other types of transformations from different types of uh, brain data. So you can turn a bright field into a true neuron map, and so forth. This is all pretty scientific, and I, 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 I'd rather get to some other areas in the talk, so I'm, I'm just skipping through these couple here. But one of the really cool things that I like is how you can use uh, neural networks to do super resolution. So super resolution means you can take you know, a, an image where you can see one millimeter in resolution and bump it up to a micron. And in this case, a, uh, you know, a, a three Tesla image um, Tesla is the strength of the magnet, can be transformed to a seven Tesla by using super resolution. 
And here along the bottom, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but you probably can, as you see how a three Tesla can, um, a three Tesla image can using a, a neural network system be made to look almost equivalent to a seven Tesla ground truth image. Uh, again, this, these are MRI data sets. So moving on to brain backup stuff, um, you probably noticed that my talk is called What's My Brain Got to Do With Me? Um, I Got a Man, and that's a, an homage to Positive K and his album, The Skills That Pay the Bills, in case you didn't know. Um, so Brain Backups is a project that's been going for quite a few years to back up human brains, and uh, the goal is to make full connectome scale resolution of brains and allow regular old people to back up their brains to computers um, and do what they like with them. It is your brain after all. And you know, much like you can do what you want with your brain, you can also do what you want with your body. Um, you know, back in the day before um, telepathy, uh, people thought telepathy was a uh, science fiction. Um, telepathy, that is direct brain-to-brain -brain communication, is uh, quite easy, actually. And so in this experiment, um, you know, one individual had a, an EEG-type headset, and the other had a, uh, a large uh, magnet um, put next to their, their brain, and they communicated with a phosphine or you know, sort of a, a bright light was, was displayed in their brain using a, a TMS coil. And, uh, you know, in addition, um, the uh, entire human brain has already been uploaded. Uh, you can check it out at atlas.brain-map.org. Um, this is uh, a 30-year-old woman who died somehow, and she donated her brain to science, and it's fully accessible on the internet right now. It's, um, I, I would argue that it does not have her memories or her experiences. It's really images of her, her neurons, but... Um, it's conceivable that using some of the, the neural network technologies like I described in the last couple of slides, that this information could be augmented to, to provide some of the data that's missing from these images right now. I believe they were H&E stained um, neuroanatomy images. You know, just a brief overview of what is a brain backup and what is it good for. Um, Brain Backups is actually a trademark name for the connectome. Uh, it's a network of neural connections in your brain um, and some metadata about those neurons. We see that the connectome has many parallels to the human genome. And so getting a you know, $1,000 genome uh, versus the uh, million dollar connectome is an outstanding goal for us in our, our work at Brain Backups and you know, in the scientific community as well. There are health applications, there are educational applications, there are technology applications, there are entertainment applications, as you've certainly seen in many movies starting in the 80s or even earlier. Um, I, I would say that some of the more sketchy areas may be in the business area. So if you, if you know what types of brains are likely to, to buy different products, you can sort of do social media marketing uh, in a way that is unheard of at present. It, I mean, neuromarketing has been around for quite some time, but uh, you know, the better the, the brain models, the more money you're going to make. When I first started talking about this, uh, there was a lot of skepticism. You know, it just sounds like science fiction. I don't believe that supercomputers can model the human brain. And so back in 2014, which is almost six years ago now, the, uh, the Telegraph, the uh, British communication wrote an article about, you know, what's the scale of acceleration that's needed to, to do real time calculation of uh, human cognition, frankly. And that, that number is uh, about 2000 times. So if computers were 2000 times faster um, and it's, you know, of course you can spend as much money as you want on Microsoft Azure or AWS or some other cloud provider. It's just a matter of money to determine, you know, how fast is fast. Uh, there are limits, of course, you know, this is a, the biggest supercomputer in the world or one of the largest supercomputers in the world. So you, you can't actually scale that 2000 times. Um, 
on the same computer hardware, but you know, just as an estimate. How's everybody doing up there? I, I can't watch the matrix and my PowerPoint preview at the same time, but I'll, uh, I look forward to your questions. Feel free to send them along. And I will do my best to answer them shortly. I think that it's interesting to, to really show on a spreadsheet type format what a human connectome looks like. And a human connectome, or rather, a human connectome it has many things in common with the C. elegans connectome. And so here is the C. elegans connectome. This is not the human connectome. Um, I don't have it in this compact form, but I, I wish that I did right now. Um, you know, it's, it's neuron one is connected to neuron two via a particular type of connection. And the neurotransmitter along that type of connection is, you know, a glutamate uh, neurotransmitter. There are different strengths of these transmitters. So there's two glutamates, four glutamates, seven glutamates, uh, or five glutamates in this particular um, C. elegans worm connectome. And some of them send, and some of them receive, and some of them are in gap junctions. And uh, you know, each of these origins and targets has a particular uh, meaning and significance as well. I imagine at a computer hacker conference, there are a lot of uh, computer scientists and computer hackers. And if you, uh, if you want to download a software that will allow you to, uh, to use the 2015 version of the software, um, there's probably, they've probably updated it since then. Um, but Nest, the neural, neural simulation tool, um, is, is one of the best ones. And uh, this is what a uh, neural simulation looks like. Um, so this is the C. elegans connectome running through its uh, motor output of the motor neurons from its connectome. So there is a sonar neuron and a food neuron. And they update and provide stimulus for the, this synthetic organism to navigate its environment. A lot of money has been going into uh, to this space. Uh, you know, Brian Johnson, Elon Musk, Neuralink has gotten a lot of press recently. Uh, one question that's also frequently asked that I, I like to put into concrete terms is how big is a connectome in bytes? Um, so the human brain contains, on average, I like the number 86 billion, but you know, it's about 100 billion nerve cells or neurons. On average, each neuron is connected to other neurons through 10,000 synapses, and you get about 909 terabytes. Um, there's a lot of sort of hand waving with going on there, but in order to fit the calculation into a couple of lines, it's a rough order of magnitude calculation. Um, so that means that, you know, based on a ballpark price of a terabyte of storage, you know, full storage for all human neurons, probably around these days is 10,000 bucks or something like that. Or the price of a very cheap used car. Uh, to extrapolate that a little bit, um, if you had 500 inputs per neuron in the adjacency list, uh, you'd get two kilobytes per neuron. And if you assume that there are about 1,000 neuron subtypes, um, you get another 10 bits. And if you assume that each input synapse has 1,000 states, you have another 5,000 bits, which would give you a reduced number, even though your model has increased in complexity, so to say. So you know, we could say that it's between 384 terabytes and 909 terabytes. Um, also, this information is highly compressible. Um, so again, you know, it, the numbers are going down with, with more information, so 200 to 300 terabytes. Uh, Russell, if you, uh, whenever you're ready, we do have some questions for you from the audience. Sure, I'll take a question right now. All right, uh, question is, if tele uh, telepathy can be measured, can it be recorded or played back? 
Yes, absolutely. Um, tele I mean, it, <clears throat> in this particular toy example that I showed on the last slides, uh, the direct brain-to-brain -brain communication was really a binary zero and one. And you know, obviously, you can simply record a binary zero and one to a, a text file or a binary file and replay them infinitely. So yes, absolutely. You know, in in almost any form or fashion, any telepathic information can be recorded to a computer and replayed infinitely. Yeah. I see. And um, with the headset that you have, um, like I'm a ham operator myself. And so it's interesting about the frequencies because I'm sure the brain operates itself at one frequency and does the headset modulate the frequency or something to make it easier for the telepathic to go or is that all organic at the same brain frequency? It's a good question, yeah. Um, I'm also, uh, I have a Yesu and a Baofeng radio right behind me. I, I like paragliding with my radios. The Yesu is much better than the Baofeng, but the Baofeng's 25 bucks. How can you argue with that? Yeah, um, yeah uh, it's, uh, there are many different frequencies and wavelengths that the human brain works out. There are alpha waves and beta waves, and there are high, high so the, the <laughs> it's it's very complicated, but you know, at some level, there's chemical impulses that go into uh, to electrical potentials um, as as neurons fire, and these in turn give off electromagnetic fields that can be picked up by you know a microphone or a speaker, and these are these are very faint signals, um, and so an, an EEG headset is one of the most normal ways to, to read these signals. An EEG headset is just a little cap with, I, I'll show one actually in two slides. So it, it's really, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, thank you for the question, I appreciate it. Um, back to my slides. So, you know, every every organism has a different brain that's, uh, that's organized in a, a different, to, to do what that organism is designed to do, so to say. So, you know, a rat has 200 million neurons, a, a mouse only has 71 million neurons. And so we, we do a lot of experiments with, with mice with these very, very small brains in the lab. Um, the, so the olfactory zone is really large in a, in a mouse. So you know, a large portion of the mouse's brain is just oriented in its snout for finding food and smelling its environment. If you, as you go up the scale, you know, a capybara has uh, 1.6 billion neurons, a squirrel monkey has 3.2 billion neurons, and you know, down here is our brain with 86 billion neurons. And um, it, it's really fascinating to consider all of the different um, characteristics of these different brains. I, I can't, you know, I'm not an expert on the owl monkey brain or the agouti brain or the marmoset brain, but, but each of these brains really does, you know, marmoset stuff or mouse stuff or rat stuff. Um, rats are much, much smarter than mice as you, as you might infer from it having a three times bigger brain. You know, imagine if you had a, a friend whose brain was three times bigger than yours. They, they might actually be smarter than you. <laughs> anyway, on to uh, more brain-computer interface stuff. Um, so I was talking a little bit about these uh, EEG headsets. So an EEG headset is a, a non-surgical way of getting brain impulses from, from inside the skull to the outside and reading them on a, on a computer. And um, a lot of people you know, the resolution isn't very good because there are multiple layers of skin and bone and fluid uh, between the brain and what you can get on the outside of the head. And, you know, a, a direct reading on the surface of the, of the brain or on the, um, you know, the, the surface of the, the membrane on top of the brain is, is really much, much better. And the, the applications are much more um, rich, frankly. So, in this example, there's a, a 64 electrode by a 64, an eight by eight 64 electrode array with uh, a built-in antenna and a titanium housing and a hermetic feed through. And so with this type of implant, you can really, uh, one of the issues is that the skull actually, it needs support to, uh, to maintain its curved shape. And so you have to, you have to interface with the skull and provide like a, um, a support 
to the uh, to to maintain the skull the skull from really sort of caving in on the the person or a monkey or or what have you. So this this really has to integrate with the the bone of the skull. And you know many many projects and companies and uh, research endeavors have have been working on different types of EEG headsets. Uh, this one, the Emotive Epoch, is one that was quite popular a while back. It's a wireless Bluetooth um, headset with rather poor resolution. It uses um, saline uh, wetted <clears throat> um, electrodes, um, but it's still pretty useful and fun. And you know, you can do meditation games and you can kind of pretend that you can you can play Pong, you can think to the left and think to the right and train a neural network to, uh, to read your brain while you're thinking to the right or thinking to the left. Um, open EEG in uh, Brooklyn is, is one of the more popular um, open projects or open BCI. And we used to have... <laughs> So this is a gentleman who is using an EEG headset to control a synthesizer. You can hear his brain playing in the background. Anyway, um, so yeah, you know, sometimes people think it would be pretty wild if they could use their brain to control a, a musical instrument, and it's pretty straightforward. This is a; these are the in, the the amplitudes of these different pads on this person's brain, and they are playing a musical instrument using their brain directly. Things we used to do for fun. Um, how do you make a Wi-Fi connected brain? Uh, well, you just need to implant. The, uh, the device from the previous two slides and uh, type I have config brain zero up. Sounds amazingly fun. Uh, many different projects have been uh, envisioned by the federal government, including DARPA, to, uh, to, to bring these things to life. And, uh, you know, the uh, this stretch goal from DARPA um, was to record for more than a million neurons and stimulate more than 100,000 neurons um, in a single, I believe it was a cubic centimeter device. Um, at the time and still, there is no device whatsoever that can uh, record from a million neurons and stimulate 100,000. Um, there are a couple of ideas and sort of prototypes where they have a, uh, a fiber optic bundle and the fiber optic bundle can can be used as part of the interface. But frankly, in order to get the fiber optic bundle working, you'd need to uh, transfect the human neurons with some kind of fluorophore or something. And it's really just not a great technology, in my opinion. But if you do have these direct brain computer interfaces or uh, brain machine interfaces, as they're called, uh, having an exoskeleton or a controlling a motor cortex is seems like an obvious extension and you know why would the department of defense not be interested in these things really uh, in addition um using these as stents that is um, inserted through blood vessels in the brain is another relatively non-invasive way to get um, electrodes into the brain this is called the stentrode, uh, which is a, I believe, still a, hypoth a hypothetical brain machine interface. And it grows into the, uh, the, the blood vessels of the brain and transmits information back down a wire. It's really uh, pretty fascinating building these things. So the, the brain is essentially a, uh, entirely water. And so radio signals work very poorly in water. So if you have a submarine, for instance, you can't transmit radio from the submarine. You know, a submarine has to trail a very long antenna. So water is extremely um, attenuative to, 
to radio signals. And so a lot of the trick is actually to get around some of the basic physics of you know, water in the brain and how you, how you could use other, other methods to, to sense things in the brain. Where is connective mapping? Um, you know, we believe at brain backups that you don't want to destroy the thing you want to image, uh, granny face, granny face. Um, there are other hypotheses and there are other uh, approaches to this. Um, one is uh, knife edge scanning microscopy. So in the knife edge scanning microscopy situation, you, you have a, uh, a diamond knife and a, uh, a microscope that are linked together. And you can slice the tissue. It doesn't have to be brain tissue. It can be kidney tissue. It could be liver tissue. But you know, for our purposes, brain tissue is more interesting. But you know, frankly, this is a post-mortem, destructive, uh, highly invasive, obviously, procedure. Another uh, interesting idea that's been proposed is uh, using genome sequencing to enable connectome sequencing. Um, this is an idea that was proposed by Tony Zador out in Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island. And the, uh, the proposal here is that if you infect the brain with a virus or a synthetic virus that performs no harm, um, and each of these virions has a, a barcode in it, uh, the barcode will be transmitted throughout all the neurons in the brain and essentially deposited there if, if you could keep it uh, from being degraded by nucleases and proteases and other, other enzymes whose job it is to clean up junk like uh, DNA barcodes, whose only goal is to enable complete connectome sequencing. Then um, after a certain amount of time, um, you can simply sacrifice the organism, take their brain out, and sort of grind it up and sequence it. And all of the barcodes will indicate the exact structure of the connectome of that, that organism. Again, um, you know, it's clearly illegal to sacrifice a person for the purposes of scanning their brain. But for mice and rats and chimps, uh, you know, it, you just need to put a proposal together that's approved by your institutional IRB, and you're off to the races. Uh, we believe that there are many alternatives, uh, including artificial intelligence and nanoparticles that allow at least the, the opportunity to, to perform novel non-invasive in vivo uh, imaging of the human connectome. Um, many of these imaging contrast agents can be barcoded. Um, so if you have a barcoded nanoparticle, then you can watch it as it diffuses around the brain. And one design is a ligand plus a contrast providing agent giving you a specific targeted contrast particle or agent. And a other technology involves the use of targeted RNA aptamers um, with gold nanoparticles in order to provide the same contrast. It turns out that this work that we were doing back in the day is still being used as we speak um, for targeted uh, coronavirus detection. So the antibody test actually uses something very similar to this. The, the antibody test is what's called a sandwich assay in a lateral flow device format where uh, antibodies use these, these same nanoparticles with ligands attached to them to, to bind to a test line on a lateral flow device. So, uh, you know, I, I would say that home diagnostics are, this is like a, a home diagnostic, you know, whereas today you can a woman can determine whether she's pregnant or not by using a home diagnostic. This is a, an at-home potentially diagnostic for different forms of neurodegenerative disease. Um, numerous studies have, have been done to decode what people are seeing in their brain using uh, artificial intelligence or, or you know, simple line simple you know, logistic regression or something like that. So using an MRI signal, one can get an approximation of what the person is looking at. Um, these neural networks are trained very simply by a person sitting in an MRI machine and uh, being presented with a clip and then 
they they take away the training data and they reconstruct what a person is is looking at in another environment. I, I'd love to see these experiments updated with uh, with modern techniques, but this was the original experiment decoding the visual cortex. As well, the um, the auditory cortex has been decoded, Walter. as it were. Walter. Walter. Structure. Count. Count. Property. You know, this uses a uh, one of these ECOG arrays, so that these little red dots are electrodes that are touching the surface of the brain. And so doing this type of auditory reconstruction is not possible without um, really direct contact with the brain. So you know, no one is, is reading your thoughts without you really knowing that they're in there, um, touching your brain. So don't worry. But you know, for scientists, this is uh, fun. As I mentioned, you know, uh, one one powerful approach is the use of contrast agents. Here, are these contrast agents, these little black dots, are gold nanoparticles with uh, glycine receptor ligands attached to them. The goal really is to augment um, some of the earlier images that I showed from uh, the Brain Atlas with more information about different subtypes of receptors and transporters. And these these can simply be listed out. So you know, uh, there are many different types of dopaminergic um, receptors. So D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. So these are five different types of dopaminergic receptors. There are many different types of um, adrenergic receptors. There are many different types of GABAergic receptors. But they all actually have a you know, a gene accession ID or a uniprot accession ID. And what that means is that they can have ligands designed for those specific receptors specifically. Um, there's no, there aren't very many unknowns um, in terms of, you know, the structure of individual receptors. It's really a matter of getting that information out of the brain into some format in a highly parallelized fashion. Um, a typical MRI or CT machine images at about two to three millimeters resolution, and you know, getting to a, a micron or a tenth of a micron really is an outstanding goal. Here is a uh, a high resolution CT image of a piece of human brain with a very short scan time. Uh, so this was only a six minute scan, but it was able to image ten thousand times better than a traditional MRI or CT. And zooming it up more, here's even higher resolution, you know, neurons and dendrites, and, and just some more gratuitous brain imagery. These are some data that we took on a high resolution uh, nano CT machine, a, a Bruker nano CT machine. Here, the the voxel size was uh, 20 microns, but that's not because we we needed to. Uh, I mean, the machine images down to 0.2 microns, but in order to get this is a this is a rat brain with a contrast agent, so all of the the white material you see is blood vessels in a rat brain um, with a contrast agent that consists of gadolinium, and uh, you know it's it's pretty amazing to realize that right now there are machines that will image a a block of human tissue, human tissue or rat tissue or whatever tissue at the resolution we're seeking, which is you know, a tenth of a micron. Um, it just requires a little bit of know-how in terms of contrast to get the, the images to show up properly. So this is a healthy rat brain, and this is a diseased rat brain. So these rats were part of an experiment we did where they were exposed to blasts. And so the, the blast exposed, like a, the person was in a tank and the, a bomb went off, um, you know, that's, that's the, the scenario that we're looking at here. So if, if you, God forbid, know somebody who's been in a, a bomb attack and you know there was an explosion very close to their head, that this may be what their, their neurovasculature looks like. So very, a huge loss of blood flow. So again, this is the healthy rat brain and this is the, the blast exposed uh, rat brain. Just a, a huge, incredible pathology. 
many many people working in this area um, are quite enamored of the idea of nanorobots. And so here is a, an artist's depiction of what a nanorobot might do uh, were it to uh, cruise around in the brain and try to determine you know, what is the connectivity from neuron one to neuron two or neuron 50 million to neuron 60 million and one. Um, this is not a particularly scientific uh, depiction here, but what it shows is something similar to what I showed on the previous slide, which is a, a gold nanoparticle with dimensions something on the order of 25 to 45 nanometers with a ligand attached to it chemically. And that ligand has specificity to different targets in, in the brain. Again, you know, artificial intelligence is a huge advantage here. And so this is a um, block nine microns by six, seven microns by 4.9 microns of the human somatosensory cortex. And the goal here is to uh, pull out all of the synapses. So the synapses are these flat sort of pancake-like stru structures in the brain and uh, a neural network or a modified neural network was used to, to pull these out. So these are the, you know, the, you know, several hundred uh, synapses in a very small nine micron block of uh, human somatosensory cortex tissue. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who, who think that, you know, there's something inherent about the brain that makes it um, impossible to simulate or, you know, that it's just too complicated. And, uh, you know, there are many, there are many arguments against that. And I, I think, frankly, over the many years I've been doing this, it's becoming more and more easy to, to, to disprove this. But uh, briefly, you know, brain functions are not computable. Uh, computability actually has a definition or a mathematical definition. And that definition uh, essentially says that if there's a finite amount of information that it can be computed quite easily. So obviously the human brain has a finite amount of information. It's encompassed within your skull and you know, there's a border. So it's, it's finite. Um, what are the ethical implications of brain imaging? You know, frankly, as a scientist and uh, someone who works in hospitals with trying to improve patient care, uh, you know, it, it's like if we knew what was wrong with, with people with dementia or Alzheimer's or other mental health issues, then we'd be able to treat them more accurately. So, you know, right now, I think that the human brain is, is one of the most important areas for, for science. And uh, it's the more information we have about the brain, the, the better we'll be able to, to treat people. Now, in the future, um, you know, Brain imaging can save us from the AIs, or at least it's worth trying. Um, so I coined this term, the Russell point. So in the Russell point, human characteristics are preserved by necessity for the human performance curve. So as computers get better than people, um, hopefully the Russell point will be the point at which human performance exceeds machine uh, performance um, and keeps us human. What's next? Um, of course, there's a lot of work uh, from companies and DARPA and implanted CPUs and databases of neural codes and Elon Musk and Kernel and many other companies are working on that. Um, I think that using artificial intelligence to analyze the brain will be hugely impactful in the next several years. Um, you know, and frankly, the optimistic goal of making a thousand dollar connectome seems uh, somewhat easy now compared to when we started this. Um, anyway, uh, that's my talk. They telling me to get off the virtual stage here in uh, New York City, but I'm open for questions. All right, thank you very much, Russell. That was really excellent. And I, my apologies for misspeaking before. I should have said well known and uh, forget all that other stuff uh, that I misspoke about. <laughs> All right, our first question for you is, at HOPE, we've had some talks addressing machine learning and AI, as you were just mentioning about. Uh, they are so different today than what, are you, than what you are talking about with the extensive connectome. 
Can you comment on the utility of modern AI techniques relative to what you were working on? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. That's a, that's a big area right now. Um, you know, there are conferences on how to use brain imaging to augment AI. Um, I, it's 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 kind of a iterative loop right now. So when we were doing these different studies on using AI to analyze brains, the biggest bottleneck was having a human annotate the brain because you know only a human knew what these different features were. And so I think having uh, self-training neural networks or you know whatever the next advances in deep neural networks will, will make it easier to image the brain and then there, will, there may be some kind of loop regarding you know uh, a neural network that trains itself to analyze human brains in ways that humans couldn't do. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, next question that we have is, what about the issues of full simulation of these scans? Like, would it be ethical to try and wake up a brain in some software vat? I think it might be not, according to the questioner. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a, a question that comes up quite often. You know, the, uh, the paradox of waking up your, your brain back up and having them meet you. Um, you know, I, I think over the years, the, the opinion on this has changed somewhat. I, I feel like it's sort of the great unknown. It's like, you know, before we had radios, wouldn't it be really freaky if someone was like talking to you in your radio, but they were five miles away? I mean, that's that's just not possible. So I think I think it's more of a, a, a societal or a a climatization issue than it is really a technological issue. I, I think the technological issue is relatively straightforward. Yes, the uh, evolution of things happens more and more rapidly, it seems. So the next question is, are we closer to having a functional compu computational model of the brain or being able to build synthetic biological models of the brain? Yeah, yeah. Um, also a relatively common question, um, which is fine. It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, personally, I think that building, you know, wet brains with real neurons at the level that, that is interesting for any computation or, you know, consciousness is, is really very complicated and slow. So I think that, you know, having to grow, you know, layer by layer of wet neurons and having them interface and then putting them into a body so that it can experience life is, is not a particularly appealing technology to me. I, it just seems very, you know, if you've ever grown cells in a laboratory, you know, the idea is a little bit absurd. It, it's just building 86 million neurons and then getting them into an environment where they learn just isn't going to happen. So I think that it's much more realistic to image the, the wet neurons and transfer them to a a, comp a computational environment and and work with it there. For, it's just my opinion. I'm not. I'm not hearing your question. It seems like your video is frozen. Oh. Yeah, it looks like JP dropped out momentarily. Okay. I'm. Uh, I'm standing by. Let me go ahead and read you the next one. This is, um, what about issues of full simulation of these scans? Would it be ethical to try to wake up a brain in some software back? And I realize you just said that wasn't that interesting to you, but I think this is a question about the ethical um, implications. I, I think ethics are a personal thing. So, you know, to me, yes, I, I understand that there are questions as to whether this should be done, but I, I think that there are, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, Yes, it's important to understand what should be done versus, you know, whether it's technologically feasible. I, I guess I don't I don't see the reason to do it, and so for that reason, I I have trouble thinking of, you know, the ethics of doing it. Yeah, it, it's it's hugely questionable. Yes. This last one, because we're just in our last few seconds here, and, and welcome back, JP. Uh, just in the last few seconds, is uh, will we ever be able to have a full non-destructive way of scanning our own brains within our lifetimes? I, I, you know, I, I'm obviously biased here. I, I've been working on this for quite some time. And I, I think that the, 
the technological uh, barriers are coming down at it. To recognize features and you know augment resolution from a millimeter to a hundredth of a millimeter by just using a neural network is is you know it might be the missing piece in this puzzle of how to how to image a a human brain at the tenth of a micron resolution, which is approximately you know the smallest feature you may need. Well, thank you very much, Russell Hansen, backing up your brain here at Hope 2020. Thank you very much, Doctor. I really appreciate you sharing with us. And on behalf of all the volunteers and all the attendees, we really appreciate you being here. My pleasure. I, I've been coming to Hope for, I started coming 10, 12 years ago, and it's always a good time. So thank you for volunteering. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Take care.